Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Um, yes, sorry, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hold on, there was someone else who was on. Give me a second. I, I had to, let, let me, let me just send her an email because she was on and we had to restart the meeting. Okay, let's see what's going on. Oh, she, okay, everybody's. All right, so welcome. Um, and I don't know if anybody, uh, Camille sent me an email. She said she wasn't joining. She had some questions last time and I actually prepared some materials, but I think. I'm sorry. Oh. It's quite loud. <laughs> you don't feel like you can talk until it's over. <laughs> we'll wait for Mary Jo to come back. Or maybe she won't because maybe she's on the phone. I'm not sure what the story is. Um, so do you have any questions? Uh, whatever. I, asked me, uh, I do, but I didn't finish uh, listening to the last week's. So maybe you already answered because I think somebody asked about pain conditions. Well, my recollection was Camille asked, uh, you know, like, do I have specific points for different muscles? Mm. You know, which I think is a little, I interpret it to be a little different. I and see. that's, that's the thing I was going to, you know, I was going to wait for Camille next week and see if, if that's, but, but go ahead with your question. I guess my question is, um, you know, especially treating lower back pain mm -hmm. or sciatica. I'm having kind of, maybe it's due to like I'm doing my doctorate and I'm taking a lot of sports medicine, kind of acupuncture where you go and like, you know, deep needling on the GRG points, E-stem, almost like my, I'm like brainwashed that mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to do local treatment. <laughs> okay. But yesterday, you know, I did the master tongue seminar second time and the teacher says absolutely you don't need to do that. And you know, so almost like for pain, I tend to maybe more sports acupuncture, but I don't really like doing that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, my question would be how to treat, you know, lower back pain, assuming that not all of them are looking like TCM. Uh, yeah, using people's style or whatever you call. Okay. Um, there's a lot of rattling on one of the lines. I'm not just, um, okay, mm -hmm. it, it stopped, so we're good. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, that, sorry, Abby, that was a call came in. <laughs> no, no, no problem. No, no worries. All right, so Osmond asked about um, low back pain, and she said that um, there's there are schools of thought, let's say, um, and then she's doing a doctorate program um, where there's a lot of promotion of, well, for sports injuries, you should needle and needle deep. Um, and I don't know, I guess they have their versions of um, um, cross fiber manipulations or whatever, things of that nature. Um, so, and then, you know, she said yesterday she went to a, a, a TAN seminar and of course they said, oh, it's absolutely not necessary to needle locally. Um, I would say, for me, I think needle, some patients you do needle, need to needle locally, you know, but that's not where I would start. I don't like needling where the pain is because you never know what you're penetrating in terms of the tissue. And then you can actually create a problem. Let's say it's an inflammatory condition underneath it. You can actually create something worse. It doesn't happen very often, but it can. Now, I'm not the person 
with experience to talk about it because I don't need it locally. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, from what I see, occasionally you can get a problem from it. So I prefer not. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that sounds just as dogmatic as the... Um, the, the sports medicine people at the doctor program will say you must need locally for for pain so i think it's a question of what your experience is um if i do local treatments it's usually something i may add so if they have say a muscle spasm i could add a cup afterwards i would you know i would at the end add a local treatment and or during the treatment, I may do things with diet rings and aluminum foil and stuff like that. So I prefer my um, local treatment to be um, non non needle. Okay, I prefer not to penetrate the skin because I can't see what's underneath. So it's not a good idea for me to to, to needle into a pain. Um, so the question was, how do I treat back pain? So there's different. Uh, back pain and sciatica. So first of all, to acknowledge that sciatica is generally not so easy. Mm -hmm. It's sciatica and um, what, 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 uh, tinnitus are two big things in the Chinese medical books, in the textbooks. And they give you like, oh, if you have, um, if you're hearing cicadas and you're hearing horses, it's like this. And if you're hearing elephants, it's like this. And, you know, and, and it's the same with sciatica. There's many differentiations. That, and you'd think it was really easy to treat, but actually it isn't. Um, so sciatica can be problematic because you have you have the ones that are really everything's very tight and you have the ones that everything's really loose and both are difficult because the tight the sciatica that comes from incredible tightness down the leg it's very hard to for the person to let it go they can't cooperate and the person who's like really loosey-goosey everywhere is like almost atrophied kind of thing like there's going to be nothing to hold so just to acknowledge that, you know, it's not quite like, oh, yeah, one treatment does it all. It may not be like that. And then you have the sciatica that comes from piriformis syndromes, and then you have sciaticas that come from L5, and, you know, and then you have a whole bunch of sciaticas that are officially not sciaticas, but they're still uh -huh. pain in the leg because they're not down the back of the leg, but they're still a sciatica. And then you have the really annoying ones that are in the peri perineal muscle, um, you know, at, at, in the calves, but nowhere else. And that's kind of more annoying and more, more difficult in my experience than the ones that go from the thigh down. Um, so that said, um, I did a few weeks ago, and Camille was asking me last week about cases, you know, interesting cases. <laughs> um, and one interesting case, I had a, a woman with sciatica a few weeks ago um, of the very loosey goosey type, every no, no, not much muscle tone, and the sacrum was almost not held. And what I did on her was inner yin and mushu as the protocol for um, creating uprightness. Um, primarily because just beforehand I was teaching in Montreal and I had a woman who said, Oh, my sacrum feels totally unstable. And we did mushu, and that, and the next day she said, Wow, it feels like I have a girdle holding my sacrum now. Um, so I did that treatment, this similar treatment on this woman with sciatica, including stomach 41, you know, to get the feet going and to get some action in, the, in her thighs. And it really did help her sciatica, you know, quite drastically, the, you know, on the table. And I mean, she was the kind of person when she stood it was so weird. It, it, everything was so off. I couldn't even tell which hip was higher, hmm. you know, because one moment it's this one, the next one, it's this one. Everything just keeps shifting there. Um, and in her case, it happened to have worked, um, but I can't say for everyone. So some dogmas for sciatica are release L5. So on the front, it will be kidney seven and, and um, spleen nine, okay? Um, and then there's possibly a twist in them, okay, with the L for L5. So that could be gallbladder 26 and or heart 3 are also possibilities. Um, then you have the piriformis type, which will be uh, Hukaya gallbladder 31, which is gallbladder 31, but two fingers behind towards the, the bladder channel. And then two fingers above towards the buttocks. Could be two fingers below, but generally two fingers above does the better, better job. 
Um, and also kidney 16 can do a good job for sciatica. Okay. Uh, go ahead. You had a question it looked like, Osbury? Uh, I'm sorry. Is it kidney 16? Oh, oops. oh, there's something rattling on your end. <laughs> My end? It sounded like there, there were some papers being shuffled or something. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes at the same time, so maybe I shouldn't do that. Yeah, I, you, Is it what yeah. you're hearing? It just try and make it away from the microphone because it, it sounded very crank, crickly, crankily. Oh, okay. but, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. It sounded, it looked like you had a question. And in terms of like, you know, you said you don't do in local needling. So the way that I remember from seminars, you always kind of do front and back treatment. Yes. So let's say you treat L5 and you do the points in the front. Mm -hmm. So on the back, do you avoid actually, you know, needling L5, let's say where the pain originates? Yes, I would avoid L5. So on the back, my trick, my trick for L5 is first of all, sacroiliac ligaments. Mm. Okay, and then probably T11, T12, and T5 because these are they are going to adjust the spine because they're mm -hmm. the highest curves of the spine, and I would do those, and then if there's anything left on L5 at that point, mm -hmm. um, now you might add, for example, do two is a very good for spine, mm -hmm. and I might add to that do 15, mm -hmm. um, to lengthen the spine up. I'm sorry. Yeah, it is. It is your papers that are creating the crankly thing, <laughs> but it's okay. You, you do. You know. Well, instead of computer, I will try just pen and paper and see if it is any better. Do you still hear that? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on on your side. It's just that. Hi, we're good. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. It's just that when there's a lot of crinkling, it's hard to speak over it. Okay. I can just not say anything and try to. Remember. Oh, I can listen to a video. Oh, later. it's your micro. It's your microphone, probably actually. Because you weren't doing anything with papers, there was a lot of noise. Oh, should it's I? When you I move. Off my microphone. I don't know. Try. Let's see what happens. <laughs> No, I don't see the unmute button. Oh, I can mute you, unmute you. No, don't worry. Here, okay. I'll mute you for now and I'll unmute you. Just wave and I'll know you want to speak. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So, um, due to, um, no, but now, now I lost my train of thought. We were, what, what was the question? It was about back and we talked about T11, T12, and T5. Say so could yeah. do two. Yeah, for not to need a local. Oh, mm -hmm. so okay. So what happens is, if after everything I've done, L five is still painful. What I've done in the front and in the back, L five is still painful. What I will do is I will, I will put a diode ring on L five. And use a patchy, you know, three bypass cord, patchy patchy, and aluminum foil. That would be my style. You could conceivably do cups. You can do lots of other things. I would prefer not to needle it if it's really painful. But at the time when maybe there's a little bit of pain left, maybe you can needle it. But my preference would be to not needle it. So I would go through everything I can, like do four corners, do sacroiliac, you know, everything you, you know how to do to release it before you go and needle it, especially, you know, now if you want to, so you're saying, okay, let's say, you know, because you're a, you're a PhD in sports injury and you know, you know, you can analyze these things, which I can't. And you say it's the, some sort of paraspinal muscle, okay, that's spasming. I mean, that's the purpose of needling deeply, right? You know, I would assume needling, you know, like take a big needle and go into the jaji, you know, the way you, you described it. So then what I would do is I would say, where is the other part of the attachment of this muscle? And I would go against the other attachment of the muscle. If I'm going to go and try and yank the muscle I in, in that manner, so if I, and I'm not saying I know anything of this nature, but let's say you know that this muscle starts at T12 and goes down to L5. 
I will go to T12 or to whatever, T7, whatever that my understanding of that muscle is, and go to the other side of it and needle it deeply in the way you're describing, if that's my joy, so to speak. Um, and I would, I would go that way rather than go into L5 directly. Does that make sense? Um, and the other thing that can be good for L5 is behind gallbladder 34. So it's not UB40, it's quite a bit below, and it's way lateral. So take, take gallbladder 40, but 34, it's gallbladder 34, go behind the bone, so they're lying face down. And it's almost like you're needling um, above the fibula, okay, into the fibula. That can be a very good point for back pain. And I'm going to unmute you so you can respond. <laughs> Go ahead, you unmuted. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> so, anything? Um, did that answer the question, sort of? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, back pain that comes from the spine itself, generally, I would use sacroiliac ligaments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you have other things that you can, you know, that some contributing points, for example, gallbladder 39 can sometimes do a good job besides that behind gallbladder 34. Um, large intestine 16 can be a supporting point. Okay. Four corners can be a supporting point. So you have about, but the big, the, the general, the big, um, like go to for me for L5 would be sacroiliac ligaments, but on the front, it's gonna be spleen nine and um, kidney seven. Okay. Possibly inner yin. Never underestimate the power of inner yin for any musculoskeletal stuff, because it gives, what it, it gives the sense for the, of lifting for the perineal floor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Questions, comments? Um, Abby, um, yes. I, uh, last time I was on, you um, asked you about somebody that had um, very sensitive back. Mm -hmm. You know, every, every, every <laughs> they were pressed, um, they were, you know, jumpy and really sensitive. So you told me liberate uh -huh. uh, was, it was a good point for that. A possibility, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I've also had somebody since that is re has really a really tight back. You know, the musculature was re is really tight. With that, and every time I, I place I put a needle, you know, jump. people were flinching. You know, um, would that be uh, would that be a liberate indication as well, like a tight muscle as opposed to just being sensitive? Well, the tight muscle is not necessarily a liver indication. That again, the tight muscle, the par tight paraspinals would be sacroil sacroiliac and possibly spleen because it's muscle. But you know, it could be spleen three, could be spleen nine. The thing is that the fact that they're flinching, so it's a little bit like that reaction, the, the people that you touch them and they're jumping, it's not tightness, it's just a, a, a nervous system reaction. So it's hard to know if the, are they flinching because the muscle is so tight or are they flinching because, um, because it's their nervous system. So if it's their nervous system, it's more likely to be liver eight. If it's, their, um, if it's just the tight muscles, I would go with the sacroiliac. So with tight muscle, I would start with sacroiliac ligaments. And, um, you know, on the front, maybe start, you know, start, well, now that you know, because maybe you didn't know before when you were on the front, on the front, I would start with possibly spleen three, possibly even OD, stomach 22 on the right. Um, so they're releasing muscles, possibly Sanjiao eight might release some muscles and see if that helps from the front palpate from underneath. And then on the back, I would go for the sacroiliac, etc. Um, but no, the tightness per se is not necessarily a liver eight indication. Now, what you can do is if you can find where the tightness stops, so it's the same idea as, you know, with Osmond's um, idea with that muscle, find the other end of it. Say they're tight between L5 and say T7 or T5 or something, go to the edge of it and look for something and try and needle that and see if that affects the rest of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
So sometimes the edge is easier. It's not quite as tight and they don't jump. And then if you needle that, the rest of it will let go or let go to some extent. Other points you can try and use conceivably do two and do 15, possibly small intestine nine, 10 and um, the um, lumbar eye, um, you know, so that's called four corners. So th those are options also. Okay. Is that helpful? Yes, it is. Thank you. All right. Maybe in, in, on that theme, um, somebody else, um, you know, somebody's just really sensitive on, on the front and uh -huh. not on the back. <laughs> Uh, okay, when you say sensitive, there's different kinds of sensitive because, uh, you know, there's, especially on the front, there's the sensitive as in ticklish. Is that what you mean? Or well, just sensitive, very sensitive to needling. Very sensitive to needling. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Yeah. And there are people who will be sensitive to needles only on one side and not the other. Yeah, that's definitely uh, possible. Yeah, this person, you know, is very sensitive on the front treatment, but okay on the back. Yeah. Some people are like that because they can't see. It, it feels safer, um, you know, in, in some manner. And some people exactly the opposite. Because they can't see, they're feeling a lot more vulnerable. Um, it's very hard to tell. What you do with someone like that is the first thing you want to do is release the SCM. So Sanja five or eight, you know, five if it's rapid pulse and possibly, you know, their um, ear endocrine or um, can also release the SCM. So people like that, you need to go for something else, release their nervous system a little bit, and then there's a better chance that they won't be so reactive. Okay. Does that... Um, yeah. Other than that, yeah, because, and that's the kind of person that you kind of go, okay, well, before I even touch your feet <laughs> with a needle, because, you know, that's high, you know, more likely to be, you know, let me do other things if I can, which is, um, I generally do try and like to start with the feet. So this is a person that you really need to um, release that reaction first, because you can't go, you can't do anything. You know, so usually those people, the extremities are not going to work very well right up front. So you're better off, you know, releasing the nervous system either with ear endocrine or behind the ear, the kawaii ear point, and or Sanjo 8, and then keep moving. Okay. All right. Yep. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Anyone else? Any other follow ups, questions? Whatever. I can ask mom one question. Yes. So I'm trying to find an example, but in terms of the palpation, the abdomen. So, for example, somebody comes with neuropathy due to diabetes. Mm -hmm. And is your first instinct like to do the full abdominal palpation and whichever part is sensitive? Um, let's see the example. So, you know, maybe like the diabetes neuropathy, we, we think that it might be like the RAN channel might be sensitive or spleen, but nothing there, but the only reflex is like something kind of less related. For example, I don't, I'm making this up. Yes, yes. Go okay, it's you. so would your treatment, like would you think about first like releasing Oketsu and see what happens to neuropathy? Or it's like, oh, even though the Oketsu is active, I should go with spleen points or does it make sense, the question? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, no, and it's a very common question. Um, and it relates to the way I do it. Okay, and that's just about me. Okay. The abdomen is almost secondary. It's not the primary source. Your primary source is, for me, my primary source, not your primary source, my primary source, <laughs> because that sounded a little dramatic, didn't it? My primary source is the medical history and then the symptom. The abdomen then gives me more information. Okay. So, and the, here's the reason why, because if let's say, um, because for example, you said, oh, if they have diabetes, I expect the REN channel to be sensitive. Well, I don't find that that's necessarily true, by the way, but you know, um, 
And I think you said their spleen channel. Well, I don't necessarily find that the spleen channel on the abdomen is sensitive in diabetics. So, you know, so we have different dogmas that we're, or experiences that we're working with. But, you know, and, and that's fine. The thing is, it, I take the abdomen for what it is, and it, it, it might confirm some of the medical history. In other words, it's, you know, uh, it's showing me, well, in, it's not going to be in the abdomen, but T11, T12 will often have a puffiness around it in diabetics. In fact, it has it on lots and lots of people. It's a very common area where you have like literally huge bumps on T11, T12, because partially it's structural. It's a shifting vertebrae and people are sinking down. Um, and also it's, and it's partially because we're such a high sugar carb society. Uh, so you see that lot. So there is no clear reflex, but let's say diabetics, so they'll show on uh, right side stomach 22, OD point, you know, that's, it shows the pancreas. Um, so you're expecting that, supposedly. But it may or may not show, and that's acceptable. What I do is I'm, I'm starting to build my strategy from the medical history. And I'm, then I'm collecting the findings in the abdomen, and then I'm correlating the two. I'm not doing one over the other. So just because somebody had Oketsu doesn't mean that liver four lung five is the right treatment for them. First of all, maybe this reflex doesn't even reflect Oketsu. By the book, it's supposed to, but on this person, it might not. Secondly, Oketsu may be secondary to other things. So since the primary, now, if this person we say they have neuropathy and diabetic neuropathy, and they had lots and lots of operations, lots and lots of infections, lots and lots of lung problems. Then I can say, okay, Oketsu is kind of primary here. Okay, that's pretty rare in fairness. Diabetes is going to most likely to be primary because diabetes is, affects every cell in the body. You know, it's, it, you can't say, by the way, it's like, ah, it's a secondary problem. There's a bigger problem than that. Now, it, there could be, the person could have some genetic disorder, other genetic disorders. They could have autoimmune disorders. They, they can be more things than just diabetes that all take precedence. But diabetes versus, say, Oketsu, diabetes is going to win as a strategy first. So I will start, what I will do is I will press on spleen three and see if Oketsu disappears with spleen three. Mm -hmm. you know? So start your diabetes treatment, which by dogma is spleen three plus adrenal plus immune plus OD. <laughs> okay? Now, because it's also involving neuropathy, you're also doing lung eight. Okay? And because it involves neuropathy, you're probably going to do stomach chi. Okay? And on the back, you'll do T11, T12, UB42, and um, blood supply to the leg, which is the uh, lumbar eye. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if then, if Oketsu disappeared, so we're doing the front first, if Oketsu disappeared with your adrenal treatment, with, with your diabetes treatment, you want to add Oketsu, go for it, why not? I mean, I have no problem with doing it, um, but you don't have to, you know, but the thing is, go for the deepest layer first, clear that out. And what your pro in your example, the problem is that you only have one finding. Okay, so with one finding, what you have to do, don't clear it until you tested out all your strategies. So in your case, the strategies are diabetes, because you know that this person, <laughs> it's that phone again, uh, because, so you know that this person has diabetes, so it's important. Oketsu is another finding, so you can, you know, what you, what you want to do is do, you know, press on liver four and see if when you rub the foot, they say, you know, when you rub the foot of somebody with neuropathy, they say it feels like you, you, it's through a glove. You put, you're try touching them through a big sock or something. So I tell them if the sock is this big, how much thinner is the sock? How, how much closer am I getting to your foot, to your skin, in, in your feeling? If liver four lung five does it, and let's say it does it 100%. Wow, yeah, the Oketsu won. The Oketsu was the right thing. So it's not that Oketsu can't be a contributing factor, but start with the deepest layer. See how it affects everything else. Don't start with, I found this in the abdomen. 
And I, here's my trick to clear it, because that's working without the person. That's working with the abdomen only, as opposed to anything else. There's more phones going everywhere. <laughs> so it's good. Um, it's good. People should be popular. Um, so if you go by the abdomen only, especially when you have one symptom, and you have nothing else to, you see, if you said they have Oketsu and they have Adrenal and they have REN17 and they have REN12 and they have blah, 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 blah. And I do, I'm going for Oketsu. I'm clearing Oketsu and it clears everything else. You proved something with Oketsu. But if you're just using Oketsu against Oketsu, you're proving nothing. You're proving the dogma. So the, the, for me, the trick is always try and find what's the root and make that work for everything else. And if it does, you proved you really proved it, it is the root. Until the patient comes back the next week and says nothing worked. That's a different story. That's not a good thing, but it can happen. But so the more you can make a point work outside the box due to the medical history, the more you know you're confident or have more confidence that you're attacking the right thing. Is, is that helpful? Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah, yeah, As opposed to, here are the three findings they have in the abdomen. Here are the three protocols for each one of these. Do these three protocols and then now the abdomen is cleared, but did you clear the symptom necessarily? So you always need to take account the medical history and the symptom in your strategy and use the abdomen to confirm your strategy as opposed to fully create the strategy. Because if you're creating a strategy just from the abdomen, you're missing the, in my opinion, the biggest part. We are not magicians. You know, we're not supposed to like take a pulse and tell you your future kind of thing. You know, you're, you're not, you, they're supposed to tell you what's going on with them. You know, so for me, the most important thing is what is your medical history? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. And that's common. Lots of people say, these are the findings in the abdomen, and so I'm clearing them one by one by one. And I'm like, uh, and then they're wondering, how come the patient's not getting better? I mean, the patient often doesn't get better regardless. <laughs> it's not your fault. <laughs> I'm not trying to place blame. But if you don't look at the medical history, it's much harder um, to, to get a good strategy. Mm -hmm. So I, I prioritize the medical history over the abdominal findings. I use the abdominal findings primarily to confirm the strategy, not, not as strongly to create it, the strategy. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone else? It's difficult, I find, Abby, to prioritize, you know, when like somebody might have, um, might be just coming for back pain. Uh -huh. It's difficult to kind of prioritize, you know, if they do maybe five or six different reflexes in the abdomen. It's kind of hard to prioritize when they don't have a lot of medical history. Yes. You know, if have some structural thing, you know, maybe like a back pain or... Yeah. Absolutely. So that's the opposite. That's the person with lots of abdominal findings and no clear medical history, including um, genetic medical history, including the, what he, they might have inherited. So it's like, oh, my parent, everybody's healthy in my family. Everything is fine. And I just, you know, I'm now 65 years old, never had a problem in my life, never been sick. Everything is cool. I've got back pain because I went skiing yesterday and I fell. Um, that type of person, this style of looking at the root and looking at your medical history is not the most useful. That's the style where go needle the jaggy points with three inch needle or something <laughs> might be a better, because they, there is no medical history to go against. But then you have to ask yourself, that's when the abdomen might take priority because you're saying the abdomen is showing something possibly. It might just be that this is how the connective tissue is built that it's sensitive. You know, there's some sort of weird, you know, looseness or inflammatory process in the connective tissue. For some reason, you're pressing on the abdomen and, and it shows us pain. 
and or it they, the person might be super sensitive all these things happen what happens is when you have a person like this that has lots of findings in the abdomens you can think, well i wonder if this suggests okay they do have adrenal they do have you know worry reflex they do have they show all these things that the liver shows blah 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 hmm Maybe it's worth trying to clear those. Maybe they have these as potentials in their body. But on an acute injury, it's probably not the cause. The cause is the acute injury. It's when people come three, four weeks later or three years later with the injury and it's still there, okay, that's when you say, okay, yeah, they went skiing and they fell, but what else is holding that person in their medical history. Oh, maybe it's their thyroid. Maybe it's their liver. Maybe it's the cardiac condition that their father had. So if there's no medical history to clear, you can't clear it. So go with the abdomen. But then again, so if you have five or six findings, take the finding that seems the most important, in other words, by what you correlate it to. So for example, nowadays we say right stomach 26, 27 tends to be a primary finding. It wasn't always like that, but now it is, okay? Because this, this is how people are now. And, or adrenal is a primary finding. You know, take those. For me, Oketsu used to be a primary finding in you know, 20, 20 something years ago. It's no longer for me a primary finding. Okay, but you know, in other words, I'll use other things to try and clear it. Okay, the SCM is a primary finding when somebody has tightness in the SCM or the cervicals, that's a primary finding because it compresses the nervous system, it needs to be cleared. So, prioritize your abdominal finding and clear the first, you know, try and clear the first one, test the first one, and see if it affects all the others. Does that make sense? And yeah. so you're doing the same thing, except you're not doing it with a medical history. But rather than go one by one by one by one, take, try and find one that's most important and make it push everything else, you know, like a domino thing. When, when you flip the right domino, all, all the row of dominoes fall. You want to try and do that as much as you can. Now, there's nothing wrong with using more than one strategy. In fact, I recommend not just doing one. It's like you want to take some insurance. What happens if you are wrong? It cleared the abdomen. Okay, so what? So abdomen got cleared, but it doesn't mean that the symptom, even if the symptom got cleared, like the back pain is clear on the table, doesn't mean it's going to be clear tomorrow. That's why you want to take some insurance. Use your second strategy as long as you proved that what you want to use actually does something good. So let's say strategy one, number one um, worked 90% or 100%. Strategy number two only works 75%. Okay? There's nothing wrong, even though you cleared everything with the first one, there's nothing wrong with adding the second. But you're not going to be able to add the second unless you tested it before you use the first. <laughs> so I'm testing everything I want to test first. Only then do I needle. Then if there's anything less left, which can happen, then I can chase, you know, okay, chase this one reflex or something. But I don't chase the reflex up front. I, I chase them all as one unit. Okay. So, but for the acute back pain, sometimes, yeah, you know, they twisted. Okay. Maybe it's gallbladder 26 or, you know, they have something in the sacroiliac ligaments, do gallbladder 34 and then sacroiliac. I mean, for an acute injury, you know, often doing tricks is good enough. You don't have to um, go for, for the whole medical history if they, especially if there is no medical history. But if they have abdominal, and some of them will not have abdominal findings either. But if they have either findings or medical history, work with those and then do the tricks. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Right. Anything else? Just in relation to the cupping, um, do you use the fire cupping or the, the suction? 
it's Shoot plastic. Like <laughs> I, I like to play with fire personally. <laughs> the plastic I use on myself <laughs> just because it's easier to pump things, you know. So if I want to, you know, and I have to say that in terms of cupping, I probably do more cupping on myself. Um, you know, not because I think I'm Michael Phelps or anything, because it's the easiest thing for me to do if there's something weird going on. Um, then I don't use cup, that much cupping on patients. And I also, I prefer personally, I prefer to move cups, to put oil on and to move the cups as opposed to put a cup on one spot and get it like <laughs> screeching black or something. Occasionally that strategy of one place can help, but I think that, you know, you're trying to like spread it out sort of thing, like to loosen things up. So you can say this one spot is painful, but what about all the other muscles that are around it are doing weird things? So, um, and that's the um, plastic cups, you know, the suction, the, the ones with a pump, tend to not have a very good surface, mm -hmm. at least from my experience. Now the cups I have are very old, so they may, um, they may have better cups nowadays. Um, but I find that the plastic ones are not so convenient. But I also, I have to say, it's not that I'm an arsonist or anything, but I, I just love playing with, a, you know, flipping the cup fast. It's kind of fun. <laughs> you know, it's something else to do. So, um, but I don't know if it really matters. I, I really don't, um, except, for, except for the moving part, because the glass ones have a pretty thick uh, rim, so they're a lot more comfortable on the skin uh, w w once you're moving it. So when you say moving, it's you, you slide, slide. I slide the cup. Yeah, I, I, I put oil on the skin and I slide the cup, and sometimes you know, um, and which is why I often well, I prefer that to gua sha, not for the patient. Actually, I think gua sha is is often easier. Um, for it's better for the patient. It's it's more effective often because it can get into nooks and crannies. Um, you know that are you know you can kind of get it more more. You can target it better. The problem of well, the gua sha is a lot of work on on my hand. You know, you know forever, and then you're tired. And you're trying to do it with your left hand, and you're switching back. And so I you know I just, I try and start with cups simply to save to save my energy to save my arm. Um, but yeah, I, I generally prefer, and you know, I prefer to, to slide, to move the cup as opposed to just dump it on and leave the room and whatever. So. Thank you. So, and of course, you know, if any, any of the Japanese acupuncture police hear this, I will be banished from, <laughs> from anything because in Japan, we do not do primitive, <laughs> horrible, barbaric things like cups of washa, but you know, the reality is that things help. Um, so why not use them? You know, we don't have to always be, you know, the gentle, nice, intelligent approaches. So sometimes, you know, there's a reason why cupping is so popular all over Asia. You know, and not just Asia. Um, you know, it works. You know, so why deny, why deny a tool that's really useful just because it's so-called primitive or it, it looks, you know, you can see it afterwards as bruises. Um, oh, the, the only thing about cupping is I usually, before I cup or I do um, scraping on someone, I ask them if they're gonna model bikinis um, later in the afternoon or the next day. <laughs> So that, you know, you know, because you don't want to create a situation where that, you know, you did that on, on a multi-million dollar model, <laughs> you know, and then they say, oh, I lost this contract because you did this stupid cupping thing. <laughs> so, you know, and it's, it's happened. Um, so it's better not to, not to, you know, ask them if it's okay. Whereas you, I don't ask them with needles. It's obvious they came to be needled. I, I don't ask them, is it okay for me to put a needle in? Um, but with cups or with scraping, I will ask them, you know, do you, you know, is there an, a reason why you, you may not want to look for it to look red or inflamed or something, you know, because they can be an actor or they can be, you know, whatever, or they're meeting their, you know, they have a first date with someone and they don't want to look like a corp, you know, some weird phenomenon. <laughs> you know? It's okay, you know, so, but otherwise I think it's perfectly useful. And would you do it um, with like um, protruding discs? Now would you stay away from that? Uh... 
it's controversial from what I hear. I have done it on discs and with a fair amount of success, actually, but I have been told that it's, that it's supposed to be contraindicated. Um, so, you know, so you do uh, what you, you know, if I wouldn't do, to, I wouldn't do a moving cup on a protruding, or I'll do a moving cup with very, very light suction. Um, yeah, uh, from what I hear, it's supposed to be contraindicated. Um, but I have done it and it has been successful. I think that if you have a muscle that's really tight and pulling on the disc, it's probably the right thing. If you have something, if it's a ligament that's pulling it or there's, if, if it's not muscular, probably the cup is not quite the strategy that you want. That, that's my sense of it. But this, you have to talk to the, you know, these are like, you know, husband's, um, um, doctorate people who are specializing in, in sports injuries, that those are the people to ask. I, you know, Atman, if you want to ask someone of that nature and come back, get back to us, um, that'd be cool. Uh, I don't know enough about it. It's not, um, like I said, I, I use cupping on myself more than, more than on patients. So it's like on myself, I'm happy to experiment. <laughs> you know. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Anyone else? All right. Well, we could end if there's nothing else. And if there are any requests for another time, that's okay too. Um, yes. Maybe just a quick thing, Evie. Um, vertical. Vertical. Have you, vertical, yeah. Have you... Um, experience treating it or <clears throat> yes yes i have uh, <laughs> so vertigo um let's see is it three major causes i would say there's three major causes of vertigo so many causes it's hard to know you know so many different causes it's yeah so there is there's the type that's coming from the neck uh there's the type that comes from the liver uh there are types that are related to motion sickness and that will not show the neck or the liver and it's related almost like to motion sickness or eating or something like that or even chemical sensitivities. It could be an autonomic nervous system disorder. So I would start with release the, ne the neck, you know, and the, the cervicals primarily can be the SCM as well so that you know, uh, the original protocol for that was called um, Sanjiao 8, yeah, Sanjiao 8, liver 8, kidney 10. I use Sanjiao 8, but instead of kidney 10, I tend to use kidney 7, possibly kidney 9. And instead of liver 8, I would often use inner yin. Okay. And also check T5 very, very carefully, or T4, T5. Um, there is a point at the Apex of the, uh, not the, you know, I'm not sure what that's called. The, the I think it's ear occiput um, that releases T4. And I'm pretty sure you've seen me do that. Um, and then, you, you know, if, if the liver shows, treat liver, uh, depending on the kind of, you know, what kind of liver, so treat the liver. So, but primarily I'm looking at releasing the neck and releasing the upper thoracics. And then you have dizziness that comes from various chemical issues that will often come with liver or, or organic issues as, as in, you know, there's something in the esophageal, stu esophageal stomach, possibly. But it's general, generally, it has a neck component. Um, so I would start with releasing the neck so, and the nervous system. And, and if it is motion sickness, kidney nine will tend to do a better job than kidney seven. Um, sometimes they will have TMJ, for example. They'll, they'll, you know, when, you, when you're looking at the neck, start looking at the other um, things that are related to the neck. You know? But it, it's some sort of something in, in there's some blockage in the, ner you know, in the nerves, in the communication, unless it's purely in the brain, which can happen then you want to look at treating the brain. But again, you're talking about Sanjo 8. The difference here would be that on the kidney, there may be above kidney 3, there may be a nodule. 
if it's if it's true sh truly just brain brain overstimulating itself kind of thing then you you're looking at above kidney three there may be a, an issue okay anyone else can i ask yes <laughs> So you're using the kidney nine for motion sickness. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at this patient's profile. Um, so I was referred, I mean, she came to my clinic after unsuccessful treatment by other practitioner and my mm -hmm. friend who referred her to me. So her primary complaints were neck and jaw tension and my colleague actually did a great job releasing them, but mm -hmm. she was having nausea for the last six months and he couldn't help her so you know she came to my clinic last week mm -hmm. and, um, on the table she was feeling better but then she reported saying that she didn't feel any change and i will see her again so looking at her medical history she's you know pretty much very really healthy young woman and a lot of high blood pressure stroke in the in the family the history Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering kidney nine would be I did not do kidney nine on her maybe my mistake as you said you know she mm -hmm. had uh, right stomach 26 27 reflex um, okay and then also spleen too so I kind of went spleen rot and liver so she had right stomach 26, 27 and spleen 2 pressure pain. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Okay. Mm -hmm. So you basically went for spleen 5, spleen 9, which is on the right side, clear right side stomach 26, 27. Yeah. And, and then you're going, you, you're kind of, quote unquote, licking your chops and saying, hey, look, I did my, the right thing. I'm not joking. I'm, 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 not, I'm not putting anyone down. But, you know, that's very, that's, that would be the natural tendency, right? And on the left, the, on the back, uh, she had, uh, you know, SI 11. Reflex, I released it with UB60. Wait, wait, wait. She and had S, small, intestine, small intestine 11, which side? Left side. Left side. Okay. Left UB60. Okay. Uh, oh, left small intestine. Okay. Anything, any other findings? And let's see. And then uh, she also had some reflex on RAN4 and RAN6. And I think after releasing, after using spleen points, it that is resolved. Okay. And medical history, none except the the high blood pressure and the strokes. Uh, and the yeah, grandparents, etc. I mean, she has a history of um, sexual assault, you know, PTSD, but she's dealing with that very well after, you know, receiving psychotherapy. Um, okay, wait, wait, wait. Listen to what you just said. <laughs> it's a very interesting. No, no, no. Because we all do this. We, we, it, it's, it's uh, something that we do, and it's, it's something to, to, uh, to look at. If I said to you, oh, she used to have hypothyroid, but she's, um, she's now taking synthroid, you would say to me, we still need to treat. Mm. right so i'm not saying i'm not it's not like you want to be invasive but then you think about the ptsd and, and i don't know where you know it sounds like it came from did you say sexual assault mm -hmm. okay so and that's that's the ptsd is related to that mm -hmm. so so yes wonderful that she's coping but they can still in the body you know so in her the mind, the heart, has ma is is managed to open, but there may be something in the body that, that that's still holding on. The thing is, can you find it? So here, here is what I'm hearing, and correct me. This could be totally wrong. It sounds like she originally came for tight jaw, tight neck. Mm -hmm. yeah. When that got released, nausea suddenly appeared. Is that accurate? When did the nausea start? Um, uh, six months ago or so. You know, I didn't do the treatment for her jaw and neck. That's my no, no. Okay. But um. So here's it suggests things that I'm hearing. You know, so for you, the the advice I would give you, you know that she had neck and jaw. It doesn't doesn't it doesn't matter that she doesn't complain. But if you touch the neck or the jaw, there may still be residual places start treating it it's the same thing as saying 
with all due respect to your colleague, first of all, she, this may be her constitutional thing. She may always have problems in the jaw, okay? And, you know, stomach five is where the stomach channel splits downwards. It's called dying, the great welcome, and then it goes to stomach nine, the, the human welcome, okay? And obviously, you can see the connection between stomach nine and nausea. Mm -hmm. But, you know, stomach five, you, we don't really think so much in nausea, but, you know, the nausea comes from the lower, from the stomach esophagus area sort of thing, or even lower sometimes, you know, it, it's, it's some sort of like fermentation <laughs> that happens in there. But the fermentation starts in the mouth and the teeth. So it starts in stomach five. So that, you know, there could be a re reflex there. So all, what I'm saying is it's very convenient for us to say, that's resolved. That isn't there. The thing is, when we're looking at the medical history, we're not saying, oh, you, you, we're saying, can I apply a strategy? Can the idea of you having a jaw problem, can the idea of you have a having, having had post-traumatic stress disorder, and I come up with a strategy, you can call it, you can say it's adrenal, you can call it nervous system, you can, you can interpret uh, PTSD many ways, you can call it psoas many ways to look at PTSD. Go through each one of them, check your points. So you already know spleen five and spleen nine does a good job. Okay, screw it, done. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean you won't use it. It just means leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Explore more. Explore what happens when I do adrenal. Because remember, right side, stomach 26, 27, more commonly than anything, the reason why it's important is not because of digestion. It can be digestion, it can be lung, it can be immune, but mostly nowadays it's something to do with people's kidneys. It's an inability to move forward. It's the kidney's inability to push forward towards the wood phase, towards you know springing forward. Okay, so that's why it's so common. I guarantee you that 20, 25 years ago, very few people had right side stomach 26, 27. And nowadays, it's like almost everyone has it. Okay, it's, you know, something's shifted. So there are many ways to approach it. Okay, so I would start going, what can I, how much mileage can I get from releasing whatever I might find in the jaw or the neck? Does it fix stomach 26, 27? How much mileage can I get out of treating PTSD? You know, in whatever manner I do, because obviously PTSD is, I mean, but do check stomach 30 on her. You know, nausea and stomach 30 would be highly correlated anyway. Okay, so um, don't go for the, you know, you, you already, I mean, you've been doing this for like three years this time? Yeah, two and a half, yeah. Yeah. So you already know. So you 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 are you're at the point where you you know the tricks. You know you you have the substance under your belt. Now it's time to start challenging. Okay. You know? So so this person is going to you know so you know to work with less with the less obvious um, and start like pushing pushing the boundaries of the protocols. Yes, this protocol is for X, and this patient sort of has X, but really has Y. Can I apply the X to the Y mm -hmm. is really the, where you, you know, at the beginning, it's hard. You're just trying to survive, <laughs> you know, it's all these weird points and never hurt. I don't know. And poking the abdomen and blah, blah. I don't know what to do. You already, you know what to do now. You know, the mechanics are clear to you. You now are at the place where you can start spreading your wings and really like push the envelope. Mm -hmm. So that's why you want to, you know, yeah. So they had right stomach 26, 27. But now the other thing is, just because they have spleen two pain doesn't mean metal water is the best point. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, why? Because if there's a family history of high blood pressure, see what happens with, let's say, with spleen six, spleen nine, and pericardium. Mm -hmm. Just for the sake of it. And see what happens to spleen two. Now, you use spleen nine, so you use the metal point already, and the water point already. And, but instead of the metal, instead of spleen five, you're using spleen six. Okay, not, you know, so you didn't totally divorce from metal water. You still did water. But, you know, allow yourself to start going, oh, in the medical history. Mm -hmm. And if there's strokes, so there is some circulatory issue or there's, 
you know, there's already, you know, something, maybe everybody in the family has really tight SCMs, mm -hmm. you know, which was her original complaint, which is maybe what part of the stroke contribution. Mm -hmm. So, and the other thing, something that Kawhi used to talk a lot about, he talked about, you do this for insurance. Like you do this side, this is the bad side. Do the bad side, then add the good side in case it moves over. Okay. So you're taking insurance for this is a person that maybe in 20 years will develop high blood pressure. Maybe in 30, 40 years will have a stroke. Treat it, you know, don't treat it just for the sake of it and throw needles at her, but see if you can incorporate a treatment for her family history in a way that actually makes sense on this person, meaning it cleared something. Okay, so I think ignoring um, saying, okay, that's resolved is, is, is a way of, um, it's kind of taking the easy route out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. And also check T5 on her very carefully mm -hmm. because of nausea, it has to do with the stomach and it has to do with the neck. So it's a point that connects both symptoms and it's, uh, it's a Shen point, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, it's heart shoe level. Um, so it relates to, to her PTSD. So you've got, you've got a number of reasons why you want to check T5 mm -hmm. and work with that. Okay. So Thank you. Let me know. I mean, I'm happy to give you, you, know, you can always email me and whatever. Okay. But as a principle, I think that um, where you, you can go into a much wider perspective now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because you, you, you've got the mechanics down you're good. You know, now, now let, let there be a lot more freedom with it and, and stop playing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then you'll, you'll, you'll get a lot more satisfaction. You'll learn a lot more and chances are your patients will also get better. I hope so. Cool. All right. Anything else before we end? All right. So, I will, I will be here next week. <laughs> if anybody else is here, that's great. And if you ever have questions, whatever, I, you can always email me. You both know me. Um, and yeah, enjoy. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for coming. Thank you. Bye. Bye.